first time coming here, uh, welcome to ACAP. Uh, just a very quick introduction of um, ACAP Penang and also myself. Uh, I am Nikki, I'm working here in ACAP as a marketing executive. Uh, so anything regarding um, hosting a committee events or partnerships, you can talk to me if you have any in your mind. And uh, for ACAP Penang, it's an initiative from the Penang State Government. So we are here to help the startups and the community to grow and we help to share ideas on technologies, we help to share the trends of uh, what's happening in the tech industry recently. Um, that's why we're hosting uh, Meetup Science uh, Meetup like this. And we also have a Tech Ladies uh, Meetup. Also um, last Saturday, we also host a Microsoft Azure Bootcamp. So uh, we have a lot of um, tech events uh, that's happening here. So if you are interested to know more about tech, you can always follow our Facebook. And also, um, in this October, we are having our very first, not very first, it's the second already, but uh, it's the Penang Bond Tech Conference, and it's called the Tech Conference. Um, now the early bird tickets is on sale, it's 18 ringgit for one. Um, in this Tech Conference, we are going to discuss about um, artificial intelligence, data science, cyber security, smart cities, smart retails, and also AI and VR. Uh, mainly it's talking about how this technology can be incorporated in the business, how to improve your business process, um, how to uh, make use of the um, technology and um, to your business advantage. So uh, we have a one-on-one -on -one session with the speaker during that uh, conference. So if you have any questions that you want to ask the expert from the industry, you can always join us at the tech conference uh, in this first and second of October. So a uh, debate is until on it's on sales until the end of June. After that, the price will go back to normal. So uh, if you want, you can just pay the ticket or talk to me. Okay, thank you. I'll pass the speech back. Okay, and um, since we'll be using our voices without a microphone today, if you think that you might have trouble, there are some seats closer to the front as well that you can come, and we'll make sure that um, if you think that it's too soft, we'll try to speak up louder so that you can hear. Also, um, if you have seen anything during the presentations that kind of spark your interest or you might have questions, Maybe jot them down because they will have 15 minutes after the presentation to answer questions. And that is what is really engaging. And so the more that you might want to ask about, the better because they will know how to answer those questions and then you'll get your answer. Um, and so we definitely want you to ask when you have those questions. So we'll start um, with the first presentation. There will be two tonight. Um, one will be going over kind of data collection and surveys and um, how you're going to maybe get some information to then be able to do analysis on that. Um, and then the next one will be going over how you can clean up your data and tidy it to make it easier and more manageable. So for the first speaker, we have Kayong, and um, she is with the Penang Institute, uh, which the Penang Institute uh, collects data to then help politicians and policymakers to then make decisions based on the information that they're collecting. Um, she graduated from USM with a master in statistics, and she's a statistician within the socioeconomics and statistics department at the Penang Institute. Um, and her daily tasks consist of preparing various socioeconomic data and to help researchers better understand that data and how to use them. So if you will help me to welcome Kayong, she will then be able to go for it, so. Do you want me to do it for you? Um, hello everyone, um, I'm Kayo. So, uh, so uh, I graduated from USM, uh, majoring in statistics. So I'm currently working as a statistician in Pena Institute. So in Penang Institute, just for information, we are a, it's a public policy think tank for the state government. So our researchers actually do analysis and research on public co uh, policies and give recommendation to either government and stakeholders. So um, all of this require data. So I'm going to share, little, going to share a little bit of my experience on uh, data collection. So first, I will talk about uh, briefly about my job, and then we will move to sec uh, how we how and why we collect secondary and primary data. 
and some of these challenges. And I will end the presentation with the pro a survey project that I've involved in. So my main job is to collect and collate, compile all the data as well as maintaining the database. So um, at the same time, I also prepare like visualizations for our researchers to better understanding the data. So some of our, the outputs of our work is um, quarterly statistics. So we every quarter we have this uh, we publish compilation of Penang relevant data on our website. So if, if anyone wants to know any data about Penang, um, mostly uh, focus on social economic. So you can go to our website and we also have a magazine called Penang Monthly. So in there is a four-page column for us to use statistics to tell story about Penang in different aspects like tourism, um, economic performance, housing, and so on. So the third one is the publication of issues. So this is a short brief of policies to raise some issues and give recommendation to the policymakers, mainly for policymakers. And some other outputs are include like policy plans and reports and sometimes you also receive external projects. So in the very very near future we are going to come up with the visualization. So this this is going to replace our quarterly statistics. Because currently our quarterly statistics only consists of tables and figures. So it's quite boring. <laughs> so yeah, that's all. So I will move to secondary so here are some of the examples that um, we regularly collect. So, so um, mainly uh, in social economics, so it includes GDP, CPI, labor force, transportation, education, health, and so on. So our main source is largely from the form of statistics it's called Doxo. And if we want some data which have a detailed breakdown, for example, like Penang, monthly Penang uh, passenger arrival and departure through Penang International Airport. So we can ask, uh, we usually ask from the region airport, so in the heart, and so on. Right? Uh, I won't go detail. So we usually request data through email um, to some of the government department, we would have, still have to send letter and Sometimes we have to fill in up form. So I think the most important throughout the whole process is to validate the data. Because um, there was one, once when I received the data of temperature in Penang from the Department of Environment, which contains zero value. So like zero and negative, so that is impossible for Penang's weather, right? So we always have to validate and ask like how they collect the data from Penang. So this whole process sometimes can be quite tedious and it can vary from a few days to a few months. More than half a year maybe. So from the whole process, I've summarized some of the challenges. So um, the first one is our, currently our data, um, how to say, the source, open, uh, source is still quite big, the data system. So our data is scattered everywhere. <laughs> So where to get the, the data is quite headache. So for example, the investment data um, can be divided into three sectors, manufacturing, services, and primary. So for now, I usually deal with manufacturing investment data. So I know that I can get from Malaysian Investment Development Authority, so how my that. But for services and primary um, investment, I, for now, what I know is like I have to go to different departments to ask. So like education, I have to go to education, uh, Ministry of Education, and so on. So still could I answer this um, where to get yet? And the second challenge is the long waiting time. So this really problematic because it prevents us from analyze the current situation using the latest information. So next one is the inconsistent of data. So as you can see, the, in the first chart is the proposed production um, in Penang in 2017. So the red line is the 
data that I requested last year and to make sure the, the consistency of the data so I requested the data again this year and you can see the same set of data and they is very there a large discrepancy so I don't know how <laughs> why they have such mistake and then the second chart um, shows the purpose production from 2017 to 2018 so it's the continuous of, from the first chart so you can, as you can see here the January 2018 data suddenly jumped from less than 100 to about 4,000 metric tons so and when we asked the officer why it is so and they say they changed the change the recording um, method so last time they record manually and now they key in the data so but it still couldn't explain why it has so much difference so we currently on hold this data and don't publish it yet yeah and number one is the lack of data so there is a lot of um, lacking behind yet so I just show one in the environment data we couldn't answer questions like um, how much waste has been produced in Penang or how much industrial waste because um, they don't have the waste segregation process um, at the landfill so not that they don't want to share it to us, they don't have that data. So, and this really, like, it's some simple questions, but we could answer it. So, and the fifth is the confidential issue, like sometimes they say it's confidential and couldn't sh share. So, yeah, that's all for the secondary. And next, I will move to primary data collection. Mainly, our collection is through survey. But um, I'm not expert in this. I just share a little bit because I just have one <laughs> one time experience in involving in survey. So anyway, survey is a um, gather a uh, method of gathering information from a sample of people, and usually we use this result to general uh, generalize to a larger population. So the relationship of population and sample is like this. So like. Population is everyone related to, relevant to your study and if you collect the information from that, that's for a census and for example, we have the population and housing census by normal uh, statistic but it is published every 10 years so like most of the researchers um, don't have that much time and that um, cost uh, financial so what we do is to sample a subset so a subset from the population, so that's called a sample and the collecting information from that is called a survey so by doing sampling, you, you can't avoid sampling error because this is due to taking a sample instead of measuring every unit from the population so, but we can try to reduce those uh, the non-sampling error so, these errors include like selection bias, measure, measurement error, and processing error. So selection bias include like those non-response or if your sample consists of uh, volunteers only. So it didn't tell you um, information about those who don't answer your survey. So this can be um, rectified by um, using the probability sampling. So measurement errors can happen when the respondent forgot what they have experienced or they misunderstand the questions and so on. So processing error is mainly during data entry. So since there is still um, error, so why do we still uh, do something right? So the first two answers are quite obvious. The first one is less costly and second is one you can complete the survey in shorter time. And third is that you may a sample will provide more accurate uh, estimate than census. For example, like under time constraint, you have um, handling a larger data set, they have uh, more human error, right? So, and if you have um, high non response rate, it's even make your condition worse. So. Of 
of smaller size and with lower non respiratory rate, they give you better estimate in this case. So, over here are some of the steps for preparing the survey. Um, I think the most important one is the research, to so decide the research purpose. Because all of the framework and your questions depends on, uh, have to answer your research question. So, Second, the and equally important is to define the target population. And then, then only you be, uh, start to determine the sample size, identify the sampling technique, and choose what method to implement the survey. And at the same time, so you design and design your question plan. So I will elaborate more on sampling technique and survey method. So for sampling method, actually there are probability and non-probability. So the non-probability are based on judgment or you have some purpose. So I don't talk about that. So probability sampling technique involves random selection. So the, there are four basic techniques. So the simplest one is the simple random sampling. So uh, it's easy if you decide to, let's say, choose uh, 50 units from 300 population. So you just simply randomly pick uh, 50 units. So the advantage of this is the ease of use. And for stratified sampling, it's like you divide your population into groups, which is called strata, and you perform the uh, random sampling within each uh, strata. So this is used to increase the prediction. As an example, if your, your population has like 70% of uh, male, 30% of female, let's say. And so you want to sample 50 units from your sample, or sample. So you just take the same ratio, so it like you collect 35 um, men and 50 uh, women. So this, this will make sure your sample represent, well represent your population. Well, for cluster sampling, <coughs> Um, similarly, you divide your population into groups, but this, this time is called cluster because cluster is usually something already predefined, like districts, uh, schools, or classes, housing areas, something like that. And then you just randomly fix a few cluster and sample all or randomly sample again the observation, the units in the cluster selected. Yeah. So this method is usually used to save cost. So for example, if you have like 100 schools in Penang and you want to sample, your target population is from, is from 5 students. So you can't go to all 100 schools, right? So you just like randomly pick 5 schools and then you go to that school to, to do survey of all the from 5 students. So the last one is systematic sampling. Um, this is very similar to the SRS method. You randomly from a list of um, units, so you just randomly pick a starting point and then you collect every K unit. But um, this method is good, but then uh, it's not suitable for periodic data or data with some pattern. Because you would end up like picking, um, you may okay, uh, pick up some units which have the same uh, characteristic but miss out the rest. So, yeah, that's all. And for survey methods, there are also four basic uh, methods mail or email, and then phone, online, and face to face. So, um, I won't go detail into their pros and cons, but mail, phone, and on online can access to wide population, and they are easy to implement and quite like, uh, cheap to carry out. But, um, Mail or basically mail uh, will result in low response rate and phone you have to limit your length of survey so that people don't get impatient to you. And for online, of course there is a lot there are a lot of advantages, but you may end up having selection bias because only those who want wants to answer the question may answer, will answer the question. So for face to face it is limited to um, certain population is time consuming and expensive, but it's usually have um, very uh, good response rate. So, and 
interviewer can ask like follow up questions to understand better understand the situation. So this method is usually used to get uh, qualitative data. Oh yeah, some tips for designing questions. Uh, I think the most important one is to pretest the question there. So you always have to pretest like let your friends other than the one who designed the question there to to look at to do the question. Survey question. And then for the questions, you have to keep the words simple and clear. Try to avoid double negatives like it is not unusual. So let's just say it is usual. <laughs> so no, don't make people confused. And then ask only one concept of question. And we have to also pay attention to question order effect. It means like how you which question to ask first. So the rule of thumb is to ask the general one and then the specific question. And finally, try to avoid questions that would motivate the respondent to, to say what you would like to hear. So, yeah, this is the project that I have been involved in. So, this project comes from the organizer of Asia Pacific Master Game. So, this game it was held in September 2017. Ah, 2018, sorry. So, they, they want to estimate. Um, the economic impact of the game on demand. So we just consider direct economic impact. So consist consists of spending of visitors and event operational impact. So the second item, the event income and cost can be obtained from the organizer. So our survey just focus on spending of visitors. So our survey objective narrows down to estimate the average daily spending of visitors in Penang due to the games, whatever they spend for the game. And so our target population is all visitors coming to Penang for the APNG, um, whether they are participants, non-playing officials, or just visitors, the, the spectators. And the duration is nine days throughout the game. And we choose we choose stratified sampling by nationality, sport, and gender so that it represents, we, we, can, we cover all of them based <coughs> uh, on the promotion, uh, promotion. So, and we use face-to-face um, -face interview or survey because we want to make sure we have good response rate because we can't have any follow-up analysis after they went back to their country or state. So from the survey, we want to estimate the number of non-registered companies for each attendee. So some of them, they, the participants, let's say, they come to the, uh, the event, for the event, but their families or friends don't come. So you kind of like uh, catch, uh, estimate that number. And we also want to estimate uh, the length of stay, average daily spending per visitor, and also get some feedback for the from the for the organizer. So as you can see, just we choose a uh, stratified sampling. So the sample share and the population share are quite the same, but it runs a little bit because uh, at the time that we make our calculation, uh, the list is not finalized yet. And we have question asking like, has anyone accompanied you to this game, and how many of them are not registered? And so we calculate the ratio of one attendees per non attendee. And then we have how many nights in total are you spending in Penang to, to capture uh, the duration of stay. And next is the daily expenditure per person in different uh, aspects like accommodation, transport, uh, food and beverage, tourism, attraction, and so on. So here is the summary of our results. So it times um, the average daily expenditure with the average length of stay and the number of attendees. So this is the total spending, 17 million, 17.5 million ringgit. So and here are some of the feedback. Uh, most of them are quite kind enough. To give um, two which is satisfied, so the red line, the horizontal line, the average score. And but at the same time that uh, the 
there are also quite a lot of com uh, comments for improvement, especially in the schedules and communication and facilities and registration. So among the facilities, meals, uh, the com the co um, comment for meals uh, consists of like over half of them. So they, they suggest to have organizers to prepare like um, at least simple drink for the participants. So that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? I saw some people jotting things down. <laughs> So um, we can actually talk about this one currently. Um, so when you are looking at the comments, how would you uh, kind of categorize those based on the comments? Did you look at that manually and then you would yeah. put them yourself? Yeah, yeah. yeah like quite manual, yeah. Just not many, just thousand, more than thousand, yeah. And how long does that take to do it manually? Um, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then you talked about challenges um, with the secondary. So I guess if you could just like talk a little bit about what secondary versus primary is. I think you just mentioned briefly, but for everyone to understand that kind of difference, and then I'll ask the other question. Um, for secondary data is those data that has already been compiled, compiled from, uh, from, I mean I just collect the data from others, I don't collect it on my own. So for primary data is the one that the researcher themselves um, go down to the field to collect the data. So secondary is like those you can get from website, journals, or whatever, yeah, the, from government website and so on. Great. Um, and so with those challenges, how do you overcome or kind of work through that when you, like say for, I think it was number three and four, uh, yeah, so like when you have these inconsisten inconsistencies, um, what is kind of Penang Institute's way of dealing with that and moving forward to like with last year's and then this year's for the cost of production, like how do you handle that with the Penang Institute? So basically this uh, data was collected from the Department of Fisheries, Penang. So this, they have the HQ, their uh, headquarters and the Penang branch. So when we have like discrepancy like this, we would refer to the publication of from the HQ. But then the HQ data is like one year lagging behind. So it's like, for example, 2017 data, right? We have to wait until 2018, I mean, uh, maybe after Ju June, so to get the data. So this one I only discovered recently. <laughs> so when I checked the data with the HQ, I saw like last week's frequency. And then, um, yeah, I have to clarify one thing is that the cockles production here actually refers to the culture, uh, cockles. But then when I asked the data um, last year, the officer told me, um, here you can see like almost zero, zero, right? She said that is referred to natural cockles. So our researcher, one of them, um, is actually expert in the agriculture and fisheries. So she said um, they don't uh, how to say, capture the data of natural cockles. So yeah, so when this year, I. I make a confirm with the another officer and they said yeah the, the person made mistake or what yeah. So I think this should be the correct one. Yeah. So we kind of like we will compare to the HQ and also ask why is it so and so yeah. It's quite tedious like I mean you have to always email or call the person. Yeah, nothing technical here. It's just like you have to call us, yeah. So if there aren't like as 
huge of discrepancies between, but like slight ones, do you, does that change the way that you're going to use the data or do you average them out or like say you're getting different numbers after you do a quality check, are you just assuming that the new numbers are correct or do you average them to get somewhere in the middle? No, um, in this case, uh, we use the, uh, the blue line data, yeah, because that is already quite finalized already, yeah. Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, yes, you know, um, for certain projects, do you have any minimum um, yeah, um, usually we would collect like, that really depends, but uh, mostly it's like 300 and above. Yeah, yeah. 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 the survey method, I would say, yeah, like if, but that really depends because before any, uh, any project, we have to come up with a, a framework, right, like how much time we are going to take, uh, take for this project and so on, so uh, if we know that um, there's no enough time or budget, then we won't do, we won't accept that project, uh, usually we'll extend the time, yeah. Yeah, um, actually 300 is usually for the like pilot study. Yeah, so it's hard to generalize the results to, let's say, to, to, to say that that represents the whole population. Yeah. yeah. So it, actually this is the basic one, the basic formula to get the 300 something. And then you have to depend on, I think that's called what, design effect or everything. Yeah, so you have to like times and then you have to assume how much non response rate, just estimate, so like maybe 20 or 30% something like that. So you have to um, consider all of that and then your sample size would increase to like sometimes it goes to 1000, yeah. There's a calculation, that's the formula for that, right? yeah. Textbook or whatever. So, or either you we have to do like literature review. So you see how um, usually what are the rate that people assume. <coughs> so yeah, from usually it's from literature review. We have to do a lot of literature review before um, starting a project. But do you foresee any specificities? For example, if you rank in Manila, so I guess that's they may not be like as good as you would have in Manila. So much literature about like surveys in Malaysia in particular. Do you know? Yeah. yeah, because I, I just really involved in this one only so but for what I know, yeah, I, I never seen them like really I mean take into account the non response rate, but I think that is important actually. Are there any 
confidence interval right so that's why we use the probability sampling so um, we still don't know whether this um, the thing that we estimate really covers the true um, parameters but then yeah we have we just use that as the I mean you say like 25% confidence interval that means when you collect more of this sample maybe this time the sample that you collect it uh, actually I mean is beyond the copy um, beyond the it's not the true parameters but then when you do it many times like hundred times then you have may have like 95 percent that that will fall into that confidence interval yeah so the the way is to use the property yeah so, so i have a question really to talk to you extend the differs a lot you know like how much they on how much they spend so like nationality of course that I mean the spending between nationally uh, international visitors and also the domestic of course they would differ a lot so we want to separate them so that we can you know covers all of them yeah so. and, and what made you choose for example gender Gender did is you, just. Did we did see differences. Like, uh, oh no! Oh, okay. In fact, no. Yeah, okay. yeah. But when we do the calculation, we like try to capture it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um. Now mainly just in investment. Yeah. So um, are those investment approved by my dad? So, mm. yeah. So you have domestic um, investment and also foreign investment. Yeah, FDI. Yeah. So the dynamic signal is a big factor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you were saying that there is no much uh, collection of uh, environmental data. For example, mm. like the waste management and so on. Uh, when you pinpoint lags like that, do you have any uh, voice towards like the financial development, for example, telling them look like potentially we could like we could study this kind of, um, mm. of phenomena, but we don't have access to any data or there is no collection. Do you have a voice for like suggesting maybe not new yeah. code, but like some kind of collaboration so that uh, like data collection can be done? Okay. For now, we have that issues, right? Is for the so for the, uh, that publication, the issues uh, we really raise some issues, some problems that we we have seen. Like for example, this one, and maybe in near future, we may raise issues of like the in in how to say the insufficient of the database, uh, the open source of the data. Yeah. So um, now mainly it's through issues and collaboration. Not much from my side actually. Yeah, yeah from but for other researchers, yeah, they, they do have um, like collaboration with the state government and industry as well sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is my question. I'm curious. Okay, so you mentioned 
want to do things at the same time, right? Yeah. Like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's under the government? No. It's not? We, we are a non-profit organization. Uh, We got funds from state government, but we are not um, civil servant. Okay, yeah. so, so when you say you get projects, are most of the projects government initiated, like especially to use for the things this data, or do you also get uh, projects maybe for private companies and people like information? Can you just share what kind of work or projects that you get? Mm, yeah, um, for example, like currently my colleague is working with um, government for the digital transformation project so that's with the government and we also have like from external party for example Penang Science Cluster also come to us to have some projects to look into why the secondary students don't choose STEM subject yeah so they come like want to know the um, the root cause of that yeah so we have like i i, would, I don't know how much proportion proportion can i say half half but yeah we have like from both party so that's all Sorry, uh, again, transfer? Like the car flows you with that people is all on the base. Um, yeah. no. Yeah, generally, yeah. generally speaking, do you work or so on like urban planning or? Um, not our department, but we have another department called, um, what is the fact? Urban studies, yeah, they have, yeah, they kind of like maybe involved in the PDMP, the finance transfer. But master plan, yeah, project. But okay, not from... separate departments. Yeah. Okay. So for the back to the transportation, currently we only have data of like number of new newly registered vehicles, yeah. For now, yeah, because JPJ kind of like quite strict on <laughs> controlling their data. But from Ministry of Transport, you can have I think what is that called the I forgot what is that, like the traffic, the, the traffic flow for different roads, I think, yeah. yeah. But that is not Penang specific, I mean, it's for the whole Malaysia. Yeah. Do you use your Um, we try to share as much as possible. Yeah. So from my perspective, I actually like to like open up all the data to public. But then, yeah, sometimes they will come after us, you know, <laughs> because we we have to buy the data actually. Yeah. Still like same as the common public, we have to buy the data. Yeah. So from department statistics, like for example, the detail breakdown for labor force or whatever. So we. We can like um, we can use the data in the report, but we cannot like open to public. Yeah. Is there any software tools that you're using to store the data? Oh, well, currently it's just Excel. Yeah. Um, when did you guys start collecting all this data? Uh, when did you start collecting? And when did this initiative start? Um, I think quite long ago, but because I was quite new, so <laughs> um, but we have data like since some of the data we have since 1999 for the trade data, for example. Yeah, so I think back then they have already, but last time was quite messy. Our own database, even our own database, is quite messy. So now I'm I'm just, uh, I think when I enter the next video, I try to, uh, my major project is to like, you know, try to maintain and clear all the data, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
there is no, uh, at, at the beginning, you said that uh, you are making you move towards visualization. Mm -hmm. Like, can you tell us more about that? Like, what do you, what do you want to do? Is it uh, something online or is it for the print or like, like on me or like you have other options? What, what's the, uh, uh, yeah, for the visualization, um, we are currently using Tableau. So, um, that why we have the tablet public, right? So I think we will incorporate the tablet public into our website. So yeah, that then you all can just like download the data and so on. So currently we only prepare like five visuals because yeah, just starting. So go on, we will have more. Yeah. So it's towards the uh, like the public uh, you meant like. Like new visualization with the existing data yeah. towards the uh, like like the manager public. Right? It's, it's not it's not really for some of the uh, of the project that we are doing. It's a general yeah. It's a general move. Yeah. It's actually a way that uh, statisticians could actually use the data collected and to actually predict future trends. Um. Yeah, but we seldom do that because you know um. Sometimes they, I mean, I don't know, but uh, other researchers will say like um, it's quite sensitive uh, to, you know, when you give the wrong prediction and so So usually we would get, the prediction will be done by the department itself. So we would just get the prediction from them. Yeah, but I think, yeah, of course you, you use the data to do the prediction. But we seldom do that for now, as I see. Okay, I think we have time for one question. One more. Anyone? Yes. Okay, let's say you have a million of data. Mm -hmm. So, by looking at the data, who will be the one doing the data collection? Because when just now the chart show, right, there's a, maybe the data, um, correct data, or what's going on now, or whatever. So, when you get the report, when you get the data, is it already plans or it's not planned? But it's already what? Uh, clean. Clean one. Yeah. Um, if you are doing the survey, right, of course that is the raw data, so it's not clean. So last time for the APMG project, um, I'm, I was the one who cleaned the data. But, but because uh, maybe let's say that they are allowed to do agriculture, but what about the agriculture expert? How do you handle it? How do you feed them? Um, usually, but usually if from the data is from other department, right? It's already secondary data, so we usually don't get the primary data. So um, if how do we um how we detect the I mean maybe something wrong from the data is like by comparing um, looking at the trend or whatever, yeah. Sometimes usually it's looking at the trend, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, what kind of like uh, data like the data for the example to look at or like for some what kind Usually we got that kind of data, this one. Yeah, these are all the common data that we have, like of course the economy and the GDP and all that and labor costs we also have, but we have really like restricted data for that. Uh. So population and housing is also all available from the Department of Sex. So actually you all also can just go and download the data. But that is like one year, one year, you know. There's no time series, so yeah. These are basically the data that we collect usually. Mainly on social economy, no political data or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, well, Kayong, for uh, the presentation. <laughs> and that was a good segue question into the next presentation. Um, so, up next, we have Fabian, and he is the founder, actually, of the this meetup. So um, he'll be giving a presentation on tidying up data, which comes from the 
like background of R, but he's going to put his spin on it with Python using the techniques that you can get from the idea of tidying up data. And Flavian is currently a data analyst at Victor Chart, and he supports teammates on data and Good. <laughs> yeah, that is good. Okay, and uh, prior to working at Picture Chart, um, he worked in urban planning and cell phone records at the National University of Singapore, as well as laser experiments, nuclear physics, and the center of sun at the French Atomic Energy Commission. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Flavien. <laughs> I guess that you can't see anything, right? That's unfortunate. Do you want me to turn the Yeah. Um, okay. First, for for those of you uh, who have a laptop here, uh, if you want to uh, to follow, so it, it, it's uh, half half a presentation, half a workshop. In fact, uh, it's a. Uh, I will show you how you can uh, you can clean some uh, some spreadsheet using uh, Python and pandas. Uh, so the uh, overall uh, notebook that I'm going to present uh, is in fact on GitHub. So if some of you uh, have a laptop and want to play with the uh, with the notebook uh, while listening, you can in fact go to this uh, repo. So petit lepton and tidy spreadsheet, and uh, and at the bottom. You have a, like a small button there, which is called Launch Binder. You just click on that. You have nothing to uh, to install, and in fact, you can already play with the notebook inside your uh, your web browser. Okay. Uh, there are space. There is more space towards the front too. So if you want to get closer, you can. Yeah, so you can see. I'm gonna try to uh, like to increase the the size of the stuff. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. So first of all, let's see. Is it better? A little bit? Yeah, okay. Uh, who among you is, uh, is familiar with, uh, with Python? Oh, wow. No one? Ah, come on. Okay, <laughs> two? I mean, you are. Even if you are not participating, uh, you are familiar with Python. No, no one else? Okay, a little bit? Okay. Uh, databases? One. No more databases, no. Okay, I, I, I heard in the uh, in the audience that people were a bit surprised that uh, like uh, they were using spreadsheets at uh, Pina Institute. So how do you deal with uh, data if you are not using databases nor spreadsheets? CSV files. Ah, CSV files. Okay, that's a little bit like spreadsheet, not, not that bad. Okay, so so then I, I will take a step uh, back and uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, this kind of uh, interface. Python notebook or notebook in general? Anyone? Thank you for you. Ah, okay, okay. So, so, uh, so notebook. It was uh, kind of invented like a couple of years ago. It, it was trying to to uh, merge uh, like code IDE and uh, browser, so that you can do both uh, like type text, bring visualization, and on top of that. Uh, code inside the browser. Okay, so what you see here, it's uh, it's kind of the last uh, enhancement of notebooks. It's called Jupyter Lab. So it started with Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter stands for Julia, Python, and R. So Python, you know, R it's a more a statistics uh, language, and Julia is a language that was inv invented a couple of years ago at the MIT. Um, the idea behind was, in fact, to uh, to create something which is as easy as uh, to read as Python, but which is more powerful in terms of a computational uh, uh, power. So, like for example, if you run a loop uh, on Julia, the first loop is quite slow, but then the code compile your loop, and then your second the second time that you are executing your code, it's much much faster. So it was trying to bridge the gap between interpreted languages like Python and compiled languages like uh, C or C++, for example. So Jupyter came from that, and uh, uh, it was 
like the idea was really like to bring a nice interface for like merging things like code visualization and uh, data exploration with text and, uh, and so on. So the one that you see here, you, uh, you have the opportunity to, uh, so you have like, like a file system for checking out all the, the different things that you have in your folders. You uh, usually run a kernel, so a kernel is something that will execute the code. So you can use it for Python. I told you you can execute, you can use it for R, for Julia. But the community has in fact developed many many kernels. So you can do Go, you can do C++, you can do Ruby on Rails. You can there are many many uh, uh, possibilities using the using the uh, this interface. Uh, the rest it doesn't matter so much. So okay, so the interface that the interface that you see here. Uh, within it, you can in fact use many different uh, uh, aspects. So one is that, so the the element, the the unit things uh, where you execute code is called a cell. So that's the the part where you don't see the difference of colors. Okay, let me maybe increase a little bit more. Okay, we try it this way. Okay, so in this cell, I put in fact. Markdown code, okay? And I can write Markdown within my, my Jupyter notebook. The advantage is that, thanks to that, I can structure my, uh, my analysis by putting titles, subtitles, and explanation, right? So uh, when you execute the stuff, you, uh, you end up with a title, like as you said, as I said, and uh, you can put some uh, fancy comments like this one, okay? <laughs> and explain the different steps. So. Okay, so that was just to tell you that uh, uh, one of the objective of my, uh, oh, I didn't stop the time by the way. Uh, okay. uh, one of my objective tonight uh, was to show you what you can do with a tool like Pandas. So Pandas is a, is a Python library. Uh, it was inspired by R. The basic object is called a data frame and it comes directly in fact from R. Uh, it started as a kind of a, like project from one guy, and then it totally exploded over the last few years to become one of the most used tool uh, in the in the data analysis community and data science community. So, uh, so for those who are not familiar with uh, with uh, Python, when uh, so pandas is not part of the uh, like the Python uh, genuine code, so you need to import your uh, your library, and once you have done that, okay, you will never come back to spreadsheets. <laughs> Um, so, what I, I want to, uh, to show you tonight, uh, it's kind of a, how you can use a tool like Pandas for extracting data that are inside the spreadsheet and reorganize them in a way which is in fact inspired by databases. So usually in, in databases, uh, each record is represented by a row and each variable that you have uh, is represented by a column. So uh, the, the basic stuff when you are creating, for example, when we are creating uh, databases for a uh, web application, you will have something like an index, which is unique, the date or the date and time when the record is created, and date and time when it's updated. So three columns, okay, and one, uh, each row is one record. So uh, this kind of concept is uh, like has been developed for databases for many many years or many decades in fact, uh, but it was kind of, of alien uh, to the statistics world. Uh, the the vocabulary was very very different. The way we were uh, dealing with data sets were very different for for statisticians. And uh, this dude from uh, from the R world, so Adley Wickham, uh, he came up a couple of years ago with this concept of tidy data, which is nothing more than applying databases concept to kind of CSV files. Let's be clear, okay? Uh, so that means that uh, you come back with things like each variables which form a column, like in databases, each observation will form a row, okay? So one record is one observation. And if you have many different type of observations that potentially you put them in different table, like in databases, you will put them in different tables in the database. Okay, so uh, so to give you an example, okay, uh, the kind of a uh, table ball is dealing with is that. So you start with something like that, 
you have like three people uh, that uh, have made some kind of a, like health treatments. They were tested for two different treatments and the basic data that you get are numbers, missing data, three names, and treatment A, treatment B, okay? So obviously it's, it's a little bit disgusting, like you get the treatment inside the name of the column. Uh, there are both treatments, but there are two different columns. So his idea was to bring uh, like this kind of messy data, that's how he was calling it, into tidy data. So in that particular case, you will end up with three columns that represents the name, the treatment, and the result of the treatment, okay? And each of the row represents one record. So you should have one name, one treatment, and one result, okay? So what I'm going to do uh, tonight is, is uh, try to uh, bring like uh, a spreadsheet from the uh, from uh, our world in data. So uh, it's uh, data from the, uh, from the uh, uh, United Nations about uh, rural and urban populations, starting from the raw uh, spreadsheet, messy in the sense of the uh, and there we come, and then bring it into the, uh, this specific uh, tidy uh, representation. So just a side note, uh, that was this part, which is quite long, was just to show you that you are fully using, when you are using notebook, you are fully using the browser capabilities. So that means that you can potentially, in fact, put HTML code. So in that particular cell, I was generating the uh, small tables here directly from HTML. Okay, all right. Uh, anyone is uh, no, no one is playing with the stuff at the same time. Okay, <laughs> all right. Too bad. All right. So okay. So the the um, the data are directly available as uh, Excel files uh, on one of the uh, the United Nations. Uh, website. So the beauty of the of pandas is that there are so many people uh, working on pandas now and for a couple of years that pretty much everything that you want to do with pandas has already been coded. So for example, I wanted to uh, to try to uh, extract like uh, some some data from uh, an Excel sheet, and it turns out that I I can do that directly in pandas without like doing anything like a get request or whatsoever. I can just input. The, uh, the file name, uh, and in fact, there is a read Excel that takes an input output uh, entry, and that gets the uh, the, the result. So, uh, pandas has many many uh, small methods for you to get an idea of what is inside the uh, the data that you just uh, got. So, if you try, for example, the first uh, element, which is info. Uh, it will give you the type, the number, the type of columns that you have, how many records you have, so it's here. You have here 289 entries, so 289 reports, okay? You have seven columns, and right now, they are all something called objects. It also tells you if you have missing data. So non-null means that uh, you have 274 rows for this particular column where each cell has a value. So it means that you have 16, you have 15 that are missing right now in this unnamed zero column, okay? If, so because it's a, it's kind of a, like a, like a, a little bit harsh to get because I'm like running the code at the same time. If you have questions, I would suggest not to wait at the end, but in fact to uh, get your questions when I'm running the stuff, if it's not very clear, okay? No questions so far? Okay, all right. So if, uh, if you run things like, you can take a look at the head or the tail of the, uh, of the table. So we have seen that there were like seven uh, columns if you take a look, so the NAN means that you have in fact missing values. So there is nothing inside the cell. Then you have all this stuff that gives you United Nations population divisions and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Until you reach something like the 15th uh, row where you start to have like more information about the content of your, uh, of your spreadsheet. 
So you will have something like index, region, subregion, nodes that seems like quite empty, a country code with a beautiful, um, like how do you call that in English? The, the stuff for like the next line. Uh, and then some numbers and other columns like percentage of and stuff like that. If you go down to the, to the bottom of the, uh, of the table, so that's the last 20 records, you start to see that like this one was named, uh, hold on, it's so big now, uh, region and subregion, okay, country, subarea. And you can see that you will end up with things that are indeed countries like Solomon Islands, Guam, I don't know why it's Guam, by the way, uh, Micronesia, uh, American Samoa, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, so it seems when you take a look at, uh, at these like, basic elements of the spreadsheets, it seems that all of the beginning is some kind of a, like, metadata about the, uh, the spreadsheet itself until you reach the, uh, the 15th uh, row, where in fact the real headers of the, of the tables are, right? So what we are going to do as a first step is to get rid of all the metadata that we don't need and we'll reinstate the, uh, the table uh, with the right uh, header. So how do you do that uh, in, in Pandas? You are going to select all the rows that are after the 16th, okay? And you are going to create a copy of this part of the, uh, of the um, table. And then, uh, we are going to clean a little bit uh, the, uh, the, the headers that we have found, like the, the slash n, like this kind of disgusting stuff, the, uh, the white spaces and so on and so forth, and put everything into lower cases, okay? So this part takes the columns, uh, will, will define the columns of our new uh, data frame or table, uh, which is called urban rural populations and uh, the columns will take the 15th row, okay? Replace all the weird uh, characters, put everything to a lowercase and create a list. So if you take a look at what the code is doing, uh, it takes index, region, subregion, blah, 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 notes and so on and so forth. And the resulting columns that you have are all lowercase, the white spaces are replaced by underscore, everything is a single string, okay? All right. Um, we are also, just for the purpose of this, uh, of this presentation and so on, uh, we are going to, to keep only uh, a subsample of, uh, of the columns available. So uh, the index, I don't really care. The note, even less. Total is in fact the total population rural plus urban, and percentage urban is the percentage of the urban population. So all of this, we are able in fact to recalculate it automatically. So I will show you later how we can do that. So to do that in Pandas, what you do is that you take your, uh, your data frame, okay, the table that you are creating, and you can drop some of the labels that you are not uh, interested in. The rest, you don't really care. Okay, so, all right. So that's the kind of, uh, of tables you end up. Uh, as I told you before, the uh, info gives you uh, like information about the columns, so we are left as expected with four columns, right? We dump the note, we dump the, uh, the index and everything, the percentage uh, reroll, and we are left with uh, four columns that are the region, subregion, country, or area, the country code, the urban reroll, and the urban and rural. So all of them have 273 rows, and none of the rows have any missing values. Okay? So it looks a little bit cleaner than the basic genuine spreadsheet that we have. Any questions so far? Yeah. How do you know that you have already cleaned all those weird things like underscore? Meaning in terms of the, the content itself? Yeah, yeah. Because okay. you just chose a little bit of content. Yes. So, okay. So we, we didn't touch so far the core of the table. We only took a look at the first 15 or 16 rows, okay? And this one, you can perfectly take a look, like visually, that in fact, you, are, you have cleaned only, why is not working the stuff? Okay. Uh, that you have only removed the metadata, okay? So for now, we didn't touch at all the content of the table itself. 
So we only cleaned the single row that was corresponding to the headers. Is that clear? Yeah. Any other questions so far? No? Am I going too fast? No? OK. All right. Um, OK. So now the, uh, like the table looks like this. Uh, we have this, uh, like these four columns we were interested in. Okay, and uh, but we still need to uh, to clean part of it. So in two in two different uh, aspects. One is that you see they are all objects. So object in pandas, it, roughly it means that it's a string, roughly. Okay, it's not exactly true, but that's enough for for tonight. Uh, definitely, things like urban and rural populations, they are not strings. They are in fact numbers. They are like a number of people in the population, right? So one thing that you want to do is transform your uh, data into the right type. If I have a number of people in terms of, uh, like in, in uh, software or in math, they are integers, okay? Like no gender, nothing like that. All of you are integers for me, okay? Uh, so same for the country code. So it turns out that the country code, it's like, as it states, it's a unique code that represents every country in the world. So it's the same thing that it's some, it's a, it should be an integer. So the way you can do that in, a, in Pandas is that you have access to the one specific column uh, by uh, entering the name of the column between brackets, okay? And you can redefine the column uh, by changing the type to integer, okay? <laughs> to all of the people who are not used to that, what the hell is he talking about? Uh, and same thing for uh, urban and rural population. So you can transform them into integer. And on top of that, if you take a look, uh, there is a thousand missing because the world population is seven billion, not seven million. Okay. So we will bring back the the proper populations by transforming them into integers, and on top of that, multiplying them by thousands, so that we have the real number of people per country, subregion, region, blah, blah, blah. Okay? All right. So at the, the beauty of uh, both the, uh, like, so both PENDAS methods and the, uh, and the like, Jupyter Notebook, is that at each step of your cleaning process, you can check that you didn't make any mistakes, that everything uh, like makes sense in uh, in the different elements that you are that you are cleaning. All right. So right now we are doing a little bit better. We still have the same uh, dense table, right? Two hundred and seventy-three uh, records uh, with three columns that are integers as we were expecting for the rural and urban population, including the country code. And we are left now with this column, which is in fact the core of the, uh, of the table, which is region, subregion, country, or area. Right. So, so the idea, in fact, uh, is to bring, at the end, uh, I, I told you that in tidy data, each column should represent uh, a unique variable, right? When you have a title that is called region, subregion, country, or area, that sounds like it's not a unique variable, right? It's like a mix of, of different elements, like different scale of uh, geographical locations. So what we are going to do is to bring the whole table to its uh, the atomic record, which is the country, right? And associate each country with all the other levels of uh, geographical locations. So we start from the country and potentially we go to area, subregion, and region. Right? Okay. So if you if you take a look, oh yeah, I, I'm going to make a point now. Uh, who was like that's the tricky question. Who was the, at the last uh, meeting? Any of you? A few of you? Not so many, in fact. I many new stuff. Okay. So during the last meeting, one of the uh, presentation was about uh, machine learning, uh, where th the point was to show how, with a proper mathematical formalism, okay, 
you can pretty much uh, create a model for whatever data that you have as an input. And one of the questions were, okay, but when I start, for example, with a spreadsheet like that, are there any general methods for transforming my messy system, okay, into uh, like a proper mathematical formalism, right? So the answer is no. Let's be clear. Uh, if you if you read, in fact, the paper from Ade Wickham, it's he, he put it very nicely. He said all the tidy data they are tidy in the same way. All the messy data they are messy in their own way. Okay. So when when I'm playing with this particular spreadsheet tonight, okay, while the techniques and the methods used, for example, with pandas, uh, can be used for other spreadsheets or for other CSV file or whatsoever data set, the way I'm going to use them is very, very particular to this spreadsheet. So I absolutely need to have an understanding of what's inside the data set for being able to clean it the proper way. When I say that, it's to give you this, this idea that when I take a look at the column name, okay, I, in, my intuition is that, okay, this particular column is in fact a mix between all different levels. And if I take a look indeed at some example of the columns, I see things like world, least developed countries, Africa, and Kenya. So clearly, all of the different geographical levels are inside the same column. But that, it's specific to this spreadsheet, right? It could have been that another spreadsheet doesn't include things like the world, for example. So even if you have methods for cleaning properly a data set, you still need knowledge on this data set for doing properly. There is no like any workaround. So keeping that in mind, you can see that in this particular table, you the country code that are beyond 900 seems to have a, like a very specific uh, role. Like you take a look, 903 is Africa, 910 is Eastern Africa, but then when you go to the country level, it goes back to 100 and some, something like that, right? See, Burundi is 108, Eritrea is 232, okay? But all of the weird stuff like high income countries or less developed region excluding China, why they, by the way, less developed region including China, that's, that's how it is. Uh, they are all beyond 900, okay? So that's, that means that somehow 900 plays kind of a different role in terms of the country code. So what we are going uh, to do is in fact take a look at what's inside the data for all the country code that are beyond 900. So one way to do that with pandas, okay, is that you are going to query the country code which is beyond 900 and then take a look at the region and sub-region and the country code that are there. So if you do that, we end up with all the beginning that you have seen so far, right? Uh, that was the upper part of the, uh, of the spreadsheet. And then after that, we have all these nice things like Africa with all the sub-region, Asia with all the sub-region, Europe with all the sub-region, and so on and so forth. So it seems uh, that we are uh, we are doing it the right way, okay? So, now that we have access to all the numbers beyond 900 and we see that there are regions, sub-regions, what we can do is that we can extract the region first. So, we have Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Northern America and Oceania, right? That's how we define the region. You will notice, like, another thing that's specific to the spreadsheet, that the regions are all uppercase. Okay, so that gives you another indication that those are the highest level that you have inside the spreadsheet. Okay, so once you uh, select the regions, okay, we are going to take a look at uh, yeah, at uh, the sub level. So remember the name of the column; it's region, sub region, country, and area, right? So it seems that we have we code the region, we want the country, so the stuff in the middle is called sub-region. Okay? So let's take a look at that. What we are going to do is that we are going to extract all the region and sub-regions, so the one that's are above 900, right? We are going to remove the regions, so it's a nice thing, it's, a, it's called sets. 
So sets are uh, kind of a list with unique uh, elements, and you can, when you are subtracting two sets, it's the intersections of the of the two minus the common. Uh, so if you do that, you end up with all of this stuff. Okay. So Central America, Northern Europe, Australia, New Zealand. That's weird. Okay, we'll check uh, later. Uh, Eastern Europe, Northern Africa, blah blah blah, and so on and so forth. So it seems that we caught somehow uh, properly the uh, the subregions. Okay. Uh, then, so imagine that you are doing that uh, for a, for a, like a colleague of yours cleaning this data set for a colleague of yours. You can then include comments, uh, more elaborated comments, for explaining how the spreadsheet is built, what kind of steps you took for cleaning it, and also give some references about the data that are inside. So as I told you, you can use uh, Markdown. So if you take a look at the Markdown stuff, you can in fact put links. Okay? So you can have at the end a fully interactive notebook where you potentially can give a link that's opening to an explanation of the data itself, like this. Okay. All right. Uh, taking a look back uh, at the structure of the uh, of the uh, data set, the spreadsheet, you can see that. Uh, where am I? Okay, let me take a look at the. Yes, this one. If you take a look, it seems that. The structure of the uh, of the data set is the following: you start with the region, then you go to one of the subregion, then you go to a list of countries. Okay, so you have the in you get by taking a look at the at the spreadsheet the intuition that the whole spreadsheet is built in a way which is region, subregion, country, blah 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 blah. Then you go to the next subregion, blah blah blah. Then you go to the next region. Okay, so. That's the part where pandas is, is relatively powerful. If you imagine that you have this spreadsheet, right, uh, which is in fact here. Okay. No, I don't want to open the insert menu. No? Okay. Thank you, Al. Okay. Uh, so if, if you take a look, uh, we didn't do it, but if you take a look at, uh, at the proper spreadsheet uh, like reader, like Google uh, Spreadsheets. Oh, yeah, by the way, if you try to open the file directly with a Google Spreadsheet, it doesn't work. That's too bad. Huh? So in fact, it was generated uh, with a uh, Excel 97 2003 or something <laughs> like that, which is in fact, you, you can't read it with Google Spreadsheet. So you're a bit screwed. So somehow you can read it with Pandas, but you cannot read it with Google Spreadsheet. It's quite nice. Uh, so if, if you take a look at the, at the spreadsheet, in fact, imagine that you want, you want to do what we are trying to do with pandas. So that would mean that somehow you have to copy manually like this list of, uh, of elements into another spreadsheet. Then you have to come back to the line, copy Eastern Africa, then put it into the column, then drag it for getting all the stuff, and so on and so forth, right? So you can do it, like the data set is not that big, it's totally possible. I will come back to this point at, at the end. It's not the end yet, right? It's end. Yeah, not the end yet. Timing, yeah. I'm, I'm finished? For the 30 minutes, yeah. I'm done already? Oh, crap. OK. okay. I'm okay. glad you got that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what we are going to do is that I told you we are, we are building a new, like, new tidy data with columns that correspond to each variable, right? So we have country, and we want region and subregion. So I'm going to define two new columns that are region and subregion, right? Right now, they have nothing in there. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to populate those columns with the region, OK? So when, when my uh, region, subregion, country, or area is part of the region, then I copy it. And when it's uh, part of the subregion, the one that I defined before, then I copy it too. So what I get is, okay. Okay. ah yeah, you can see, okay, you see? So this column here is the region, so my region is Africa, correct, okay? This subregion is Eastern Africa, and I get subregion as Eastern Africa, so so far so good, 
and the rest, of course, none of them, uh, none of the country is a region, none of the uh, country is a sub-region. So what I do with Pandas is that it has a method, it has several methods for filling gaps. So when you are missing values, you can in fact populate your, uh, your table thanks to existing values inside the table. So by doing that, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use the structure of the spreadsheet that I defined before. I told you it goes from region, sub-region, and country. So if I start from the top and I populate the region row by row until I reach another region, then I will have defined for my whole sub-region and region the proper uh, data. So that's what you see on the next uh, uh, table that when you reach, when you fill the missing value of the region beyond Africa, then all the sub-region and countries are African ones. And if you do the same for sub-region, you get also Eastern African region. So that's what you get here. Okay, I'm running out of time. Damn, and I thought that I would take only 10 minutes. Anyway, uh, so you are pretty happy, except that if you take a look uh, at all the sub-region, the variable, and stuff like that, there is nothing like North America. So once again, all the tidy data are tidy in the same way, all the messy data are messy in their own way. So it turns out that when during our process, uh, we missed Northern America. So it's very, very important to check that you are, uh, the resulting table that you are building is the correct one, okay? So if you check Northern America, the sub-region is in fact South America. Okay, that, that doesn't seem to work really well. The, region, the, the reason is that, in fact, uh, Northern America doesn't have sub-region in the United Nations system. Okay? So when I was trying to fill like a missing value, it took the one before, and the one before was, in fact, South America. Okay? So that's screwed. All right? So we need to correct that. So, okay. So we are going to, to uh, correct the sub the subregion for North where am I? Subregion for North America. And this time we are fine. So North America has only one Northern American subregion. Latin America has Caribbean, Central, South America, and Europe, Eastern Europe, blah blah blah, and so on and so forth. Uh, the funny part, by the way, I discovered that is that United Nations are using South America, then Southern for every other. Why? Nobody knows. Okay. Uh, all right. So at, at the end, you end up with a, a nice table when you are selecting the countries like that, which has the country code, the urban and rural populations, right? And each of the country has its own region and sub-region properly set up. So we started from something that was all in one column, all messy, and now we are like a, this proper structure. Okay, I'm going to skip this one to tell you that we made a good job. It doesn't matter. Okay, so do we have tidy data? So if I go back to our, the definition, each variable forms a column, each observation forms a row, and each type, blah, 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 this one we don't care. So if you take a look, it's not exactly the case, right? Because rural and, and urban populations are in fact the same thing. They are populations, right? Okay? So if we wanted to follow uh, the like real tidy data uh, framework, we need to somehow merge the two columns that are rural and, and urban populations into one column, defining the population type, and another one which corresponds to the population. So you can perfectly do that with, uh, with PENDAS. There is this function called MELT that helps you uh, by selecting the index that you want. So we are interested in the country, region, and subregion, and what we want is to melt, so to merge these two columns that are urban and rural population, and we are going to call them population type. Okay? All right. Where am I? Some food size. Okay. Now we have a tidy uh, uh, table: country, region, subregion, population type, and the population. 
So everything is in order per column. Every, every observation is in order. Uh, another thing that I want to highlight, since many of you are not very familiar with, the, uh, with pandas and so on, uh, you can do a lot of string processing with pandas. So you saw before that the region were all uh, like uppercase, the other one were lowercase, and so on and so forth. So you can do something a little bit better where you transform everything into the title case. So meaning that you have a capital letter for each of the words. Okay. So now you have something which is much cleaner. Uh, the point of tidy data. I have five minutes in, in total. Okay. I have finished with that. Okay. The point of tidy data is that it's easier to analyze. It's the same, every table and data set that you are going to produce has the same structure. So you can easily do things like, okay, I want to get the, the rural and urban populations for per region, okay? And I want the percentage, and on top of that, because we are dealing with the browser, okay? You can also uh, like format your data in a nice way. So instead of like dumping a spreadsheet with whatever numbers, you can in fact reformat your numbers for like the English format where you put a comma every thousand, okay? And you can put a nice percentage stock and so on and so forth automatically. That's the important part, right? You can also take a look at the rural population and urban population of Southeast Asia, okay? That are sort automatically. So you start from Singapore and you end up with Cambodia, all right? Okay. Uh, well, okay, I'm going to skip this one. That's for the, if you have questions after the session, okay. Now, uh, I will finish with uh, only one thing. Reproducibility. And, and that's in fact a very important part uh, that I wanted to highlight tonight. All that you have seen, okay, that's a small spreadsheet, right? All that you have seen, you could have done it manually, right? It's not that complicated. You get, you take a look at the spreadsheet, the structure is pretty straightforward. You take it, you copy into another spreadsheet, and you uh, reorganize the stuff. Fair enough. And, and you, have created, you have created a new spreadsheet, which is kind of tidy. Right. Now you dump that somewhere in the Google Drive, okay? And two years later, someone needs this data, come to the stuff, and has no idea how you extracted the thing. Right? You, you don't really know where the, like the initial data set, the one that you get, for example, from, uh, from when you survey, you don't really know where it is. You just know that someone manipulated some data, you don't know where they come from, and you don't know what were the operations done. With this, this is totally different. Because you keep that, everything is written, okay? You are, someone is, uh, is finding your stuff, you have the bare notebook, okay? And what you can do, your colleague, two years later, he runs the stuff, okay? And he got all the results automatically. So all the steps in cleaning the data sets are still there. You don't need to be there. If you build the notebook in the proper way with the proper comments and every steps, then everyone can run it and it's self-consistent. And that's a very, very different uh, mindset than manually cleaning the stuff and put it somewhere in Google Drive or whatsoever, and then the stuff dies and no one knows like how it was all done. So if you want more arguments uh, for this note on, on reproducibility, I really, really strongly recommend this podcast uh, that, that would be in the, in the notebook, where the guys really explain how he helped businesses in going from manual spreadsheets into more reproducible steps for managing their, their data sets, right? And you will find uh, like other like references for tidying data inside the notebook. Voila, I'm sorry, I was really long. Questions? Yes? Yes, okay. Yeah, of course you can. Like, you saw, I, I can import whatever spreadsheets I want, right? The only thing that you need is the relation between the two spreadsheets. It works, it works exactly like databases. When you join different tables or merge different tables, you need to know the relationship between the two tables. 
as long as you know the, the relationship between the two spreadsheets, you can perfectly clean both and then join them in a way that makes sense. So you, if, if there is a relationship, relationship, it means that one of the columns match or some columns match other columns in your new spreadsheet, right? So pandas worked exactly like SQL. Some of you are, are like, like similar, um, familiar with SQL. You have things like join, merge, and all of that. So you, you can perfectly, like we, we do it, okay, I, I sh I've shown you like today's spreadsheets, but we, in fact, in, in PictoChat, we do that all the time for dealing with a SQL, BigQuery, or whatsoever. So yeah, yeah, no, no worries about that. Hey, you are the MC now. No. So as you can see, like right now. Holy crap. Okay. This one is called IO and it in fact covers directly a GET request. So what I did, you see, the root URL, is, is, it's a URL. So I don't have any copy, that was a bit dangerous by the way, if the internet was dead tonight. Uh, I don't have any local copy of the, uh, of the file. Now, once again, if you want to make it uh, more reproducible, at the end of the process of cleaning the data, I should dump the file into a CSV one. Okay, so that potentially, once I have cleaned the data, I can reuse now my clean data in another notebook just by importing the CSV file. But you don't need, you don't need, in fact, uh, like locally the files for the file for working. Same, for example, for connection with databases. You can directly connect to data to SQL databases or BigQuery or AWS uh, directly without any dumping, like file dumped on your uh, on your. Local. Yes. So I want to process maybe uh, I want to take the three million Yeah, you can. So uh, you can perfectly do that. Uh, you, so pandas has, uh, has built-in uh, methods for processing requests by batches. So that's one way. Uh, it automatically splits the stuff, make the request, and download the data. Okay. So, so imagine that, uh, okay, so here it will not be a read Excel, okay, because one million rows in an Excel file, no, that's not possible. But imagine you, have, uh, you are calling a SQL database, for example. Uh, you can perfectly add uh, one of the arguments, which is the batch size, and then it will automatically do it for you. The other possibility, uh, you can also imagine that uh, uh, you have to, uh, to make requests where you have to input some, some variable into your request. Like, I'm querying a database and I need to input the user ID, except that I have 100,000 user ID to input, okay? That will break your SQL uh, query. So what you can do is that you break your SQL query into batches of thousands, and then you run a loop. Uh, so outside of Pandas, you run a loop for each query to get the thousands, and then you uh, merge all the tables that you have. There is no limit uh, of the number of uh, like elements that you can, uh, you can query. We, we played sometimes with, uh, I don't know, what's, what's the largest that we did? A few, like, a few largest, tens of millions? Like 30 million. The, the big query, the big query one. Yeah, a few hundred, a few tens of millions. Sorry, I didn't get that. Out of memory on your laptop, you mean? Okay. Uh, so uh, I still have two minutes. Okay. One of the things in terms of memory, uh, it's a very good point. So, like, some of you are, are used to databases, right? Okay. You you see that when I start with a I can't. 
this one. You see that this table is pretty compact because in fact, I have one column which is urban, one column which is rural, okay? And I don't repeat the urban, rural, urban, rural, like in my tidy data. So tidy data, one shitty thing about it, it's very heavy in terms of storage because you are repeating the same thing again and again, right? So definitely, uh, like for small things like that, when you dump it into a CSV file, you will repeat things ever and ever. So that's not the best term in, uh, thing in terms of storage. In databases, it's handled differently, okay? Uh, the other possibility is that you, so if you have the opportunity to play with a notebook, I put a section where you can in fact map rural urban, which are strings, for example, to integers which reduce a lot the amount of memory that you need, but in fact you don't need that. That was just for like uh, teaching purposes. Pandas has a, a type which is called category, which in fact make the mapping for you. And it allows to reduce drastically the amount of memory that you need when you are dealing with very, very large data sets. As long as you have repeating data, then it will auto automatically map the repeated data into integers and to all the data that are coming like regularly into just the, the unique ones. And then you can deal with memory much, much if more efficiently. Okay, so um, just before we close there, if you um, signed up with the event, right, then we'll have your email and we can connect you to the Slack channel. And there, if you have questions, um, feel free to ask them and people can kind of comment based on the forum like if someone else knows the answer they can respond um, and this is a way that you can have your questions answered that you might still have right now um, and yeah this is like the example um, and then this will also be a place where we will update you on future events as well um, and if you have ideas for uh, topics and presentations are always looking forward for that as well um, because we like to have different perspectives of what's going on um, and it's anything related to data analysis or data science so um, we welcome that but yes thank you for coming and um, hopefully you got something out of it and continue to question on the slack um, and yeah anything more perfect oh. yes.